tell me who is Elsie for everybody who hasn't heard about you or who may know you, but tell us more about yourself. All right, so my name is Elston Torres. I am a uh, singer songwriter producer. Um, I also coordinate programs for, for musicians, for songwriters especially. Um, so I wear a lot of different hats, you know, uh, as you can see, I'm wearing a hat. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I've been working in the music industry for a very long time now, for close to almost 30 years now, 27, 28 years. And I've been, I've been fortunate, I've, I've, had, I've had a very interesting career in the sense that I've, I've been able to do a lot of different things in the industry. Um, I've, I've been signed to a major label. I've been an independent artist. I've been signed to a major publisher, which I am still signed to Warner Music uh, as, a, as a writer. Uh, I've been able to tour with a band by myself. So, you know, I've also been able to coordinate events and, and uh, manage other artists, produce records. So I, you know, I've, I got a good, I got a good feeling on on on, on the industry and, and uh, what it is. I'm currently a board member of the uh, Grammys here in Florida, um, and uh, I work I work hard in the industry. I do, you know, I'm always doing something new. I'm always recreating new things. Uh, I just I just recorded a new album this year, as I was telling you before we started the interview. Unfortunately, because of what's going on in the pandemic, I haven't been able to tour you know, uh, as I normally would be uh, promoting the album. But now with online uh, promotion and uh, social media, you do a lot of stuff online anyway. So um, that's pretty much pretty much what I've been doing this year, you know, besides taking care of my mother. <laughs> right. So you started, you wrote your first song at 16 while you were in high school. From, actually, from yeah, actually, I think it was a 16. I might have been a little bit younger. Yeah, but around 15, 16. Yeah. So starting from that to starting your, your first band to getting into, uh, I guess, being a professional, can you explain that process and what inspired you to go from point A to point B? Okay. Yeah. Well, so I, I did I did start writing songs at a pretty early age. Like I was, I think, 15, 16 when I first started. And that was just that was kind of like a perfect accident because I was walking into an English class. I was in high school and somebody had written a, like a love note to a girl and I picked up the paper. It was just scrambled. It was just crumbled up on the floor and I picked it up and it, you know, it, it just looked very poetic to me. So I took it home and I wrote, I, I, I kind of knew how to play guitar already. I was, I was playing already a little bit and I wrote my first song and I really love the energy of that. I love, I love creating something out of nothing, basically, you know, just something that just popped up out of out of the air, basically, you know, the creative, the creative atmosphere. So then that that bug hit me, and I um, and I just really wanted to learn how to write songs and and study the great songwriters uh, of my time and before. Um, so I just really started honing down on songwriting and listening to a lot of different artists, trying my song, uh, my, my hand on songwriting. By that time, I was already playing in a band. We were playing mostly cover songs, other people's songs. And soon after, the, the singer that we had in the band, I was the guitar player of the band. Uh, but soon after, the lead singer of that band quit the band and they made me the lead singer. I was a shy kid, but I, you know, I was up for the challenge and I, and I took the, the helm to, to be the singer, to be the singer of the band. And then I just, you know, I, I started, I, I had a guitar teacher, I had a voice teacher, and I, I never really took songwriting lessons because that really wasn't available back then, you know, um, as, it, as it is now. So I kind of learned by myself just by listening to the artists that I enjoyed listening to, which were people like, you know, like Bob Marley, like Paul Simon, like the Beatles and U2 and the Police, the bands that I used to listen to growing up. Uh, and from there, I, you know, I started a, an original band in New York City. I grew up in New York City and we, we started playing around town. You know, people started noticing us. Uh, soon after that, I decided to move down to South Florida because the person that I was working with, my, my songwriting partner, had moved down here. And when I moved down here, he had decided to quit music. Not to, I didn't know that he was going to quit music. <laughs> if not, I probably wouldn't have left New York. But I left New York and I moved down here, but I moved down to Miami right at the perfect time of the Latin crossover. Um, that's when uh, 
Ricky Martin, uh, you know, the Miami Sound Machine, Shakira, they were all doing their thing here. And it would, they were just kind of like developing the whole Latin crossover thing. And I kind of fell into that whole vibe, you know? I was bi I've always been bilingual, um, so I could write in Spanish and English. So I, I met a producer named Rodolfo Castillo who opened his doors to me. And just around that time, he was starting a, a small label. And he really liked what I was doing as a songwriter. Um, and he signed me. I was the first artist that he signed to his label. We released a single back in 94, 94, yeah. And the single got some buzz, you know, on the radio and, you know, locally. And subsequently to that, I wanted to start a band in Miami so I could start playing live. And I created the band called Fulano. And that band, Fulano, wound up being signed to a major label, which was RCA back then. And we got signed to a major label. And you know, we started touring around the country. We recorded our album, a major label release. And we got to tour you know, in Mexico and the States and some of Canada, some of Latin America. And kind of like my career took off there. And then uh, soon after that, Warner Chapel Music, which is Warner Music, noticed me as, as uh, they liked my songs with the bands. So they signed me as an artist songwriter. And from there on, when that band broke up, we broke up in 2000. The guy, two of the guys left with Shakira to play with her, with her band. And I kind of, you know, I was a little bit disappointed that the band had broken up, but I, I had the perfect opportunity to dedicate myself to writing songs, not only for myself, but for other artists. And that kind of took off for me as well. So I started writing songs for other artists and I started getting placements on other people's uh, uh, records. And then I started getting hits. I started getting like top 10 hits and I wound up getting a number one hit in the Latin charts and all that. So from then on, I just kind of like, I've had a dual career where, you know, I'm also, I'm an artist, but I also write songs for other artists. So, you know, that's basically how, you know, I gave you the condensed version of it. <laughs> right. That's how, that's more or less how it, you know, it, uh, it evolved. So coming from that, coming into the business, at in the 90s you know early 2000s until now how have you seen the change what has you know as a songwriter or as an artist what are i guess key things to look at from your perspective and what are the changes from then to now well i mean definitely I mean, the obvious thing is social media. We didn't we didn't have social media back then. We didn't have Facebook. We didn't have uh, Twitter. We didn't have Instagram. We didn't have any way of really communicating that way with with our audience or with people that worked with us. You know, we, you'd have to pick up a phone, and it wasn't even a cell phone. You had to pick up a land phone and call people. You know, cell phones really didn't happen until a little little later on than that. So that was that was def definitely the the that's been the main difference that I see where we were on tour on the road and we literally would have to stop after maybe 100, 200 miles to get a, get on a pay phone and call our, our, our road manager and ask him, okay, so we're, all, we're, all, we're in this town now, where's the next show? And that's how things used to be done then. And, song, and songwriting, writing songs, you know, again, it was always very brick and mortar. It's like, you know, it's two people or three people sitting down in a room with guitars, with a piano, you know, coming up with, you know, with songs on the fly, you know? Not that that doesn't happen now, it still does happen, but but the process for a lot of the industry has changed a lot in where, especially now this year, where a lot of people are writing virtually, you know, uh, online through Zoom, through diff other different mediums of writing songs because, you know, right now because of the pandemic, we can't be, it's, it's, not, it's not as easy to be in the same room with people. Plus you can write with somebody across the world right now, you know, to, because, of, of, because of the internet and because of social media. So that has definitely been the big change in the, in the songwriting industry. In terms of the, the mechanics of it, you know, when I was starting out, when, when my band was signed, it was physical music. I mean, people would buy CDs, tapes, cassettes, uh, even vinyls, you know, vinyls have kind of made a comeback in a boutique kind of way. 
but it wasn't there wasn't streaming there wasn't any of that you know it, you know that was not that wasn't even part of our main mind mind frame it was physical physical uh, sales and that's how we used to get paid as well by the amount of records they used to sell at record stores record stores don't even exist anymore that's that's the crazy thing you know and i i grew up going to record stores and buying the records that you know that i wanted to get that you know my favorite bands or artists that had just released their new records and now you know now you just have to wait till somebody drops their record you know uh so it's it's a whole it's definitely a whole different industry and how we get compensated as songwriters has changed as well you know again before we used to get paid by the amount of cds and physical music that used to they used to be sold now it's more about how, how many streams you get you know and which the industry now they're trying to monetize that in a different way they're trying to figure it out because it's it's very hard to make a living nowadays as a songwriter just based on streaming i'm lucky in the sense that i perform as well so i have different different streams of income coming in but if i could if i only relied on my songwriting it would be hard to make a living on that based on today's uh, uh format well so do you think is it is is it more difficult to get opportunities because we have social media and we can reach other people or does that bring uh, oversaturation and maybe a dilution in like saying synchronization because you know it's it's less of a premium because you can find any music any type of music on the internet just with a with a, a click on soundcloud google whatever and you know that might be easier for like a, a music supervisor. It makes their lives easier. Yeah. So from your perspective, does it has it diluted the the, the business in synchronization since I that is a bread and butter today, or has it increased the exposure to to get opportunities? Yeah, I, I it's it's a it's a catch twenty two thing where you know it's it's great because social media exists, <clears throat> and like you said. All these all these platforms where people can access music is a lot easier. So, <clears throat> if a music supervisor wants to find a uh, whatever song, they say they want to find a rock polka song. They'll just you know they'll Google rock polka artist and they'll find they'll find it. You know, and well, so what's happened with that is since because since they're like you said, there's so much more available, uh, easier in an easier sense. What they use, what they pay now for a sync has changed a lot. You know, back back in the day, to get a track on a you know, let's say like on a commercial, you you make big bucks. I'll give you an example. In ninety six or ninety seven, when my band was like there, you know, we were signed to the major label, we were touring. Pepsi commissioned me to write a, a jingle for them because my band was known. We we're up and coming Latin rock band, and for a thirty second jingle, I got paid fifty grand. For, wow. for for 30 second jingle 50 grand now i'm sure those numbers still exist and even more but they're not as common as they used to be and i tell you this because i've done recent ones and you know now it's maybe two grand one grand 500 bucks you know so because like you said music is so much more it's much more accessible now because there are so many more artists putting out their music obviously not everything is quality you know there's i'd say probably 90 percent 90 or more percent of the stuff that's up on social media is not quality music you know just because a lot of people don't have access to good studios so they record a lot of stuff at home studios there's a lot of people making great music on home studios don't get me wrong but but there's still it's diluted like you said this it's very diluted because they don't, you know, a musical a music supervisor doesn't have to pay that one artist the fifty grand anymore. They can pay five hundred for a, for a song that's accessible to them, and it makes it easier for them for their for their for their uh, job. You know. All right. So, what advice would you give to an uh, a producer or songwriter who, you know, who looks to make most of their money off of you no know, royalties and, and synchronization the, the the environment has totally changed and you know it's is for some it's getting harder 
to to make a living off just off of the back end, the, the royalties, making music, being a producer, being a, a, a being a, a studio head. Right. I think definitely a, 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 my first advice would be to create a library of music that is accessible, that is uh, sync friendly. What I mean by that is you want, you know, pay attention to commercials, pay attention to movies, pay attention to, to video games and all that. Listen to what they what they pick for for these type of things, you know, and have a library of songs. You just don't have five songs, you know, have have 30 songs, you know, and they don't have to be all like, you know, epic recordings. Some some you, you look at some commercials and it's just a really well recorded vocal with, a, with an acoustic guitar, but really well recorded. You know, if you if you can come up with those type of tracks that's uh, accessible um, and well recorded and different themes, make sure you have different themes because you never know where a song can land. You know, um, I would say that I would definitely say create whatever song you create, try to create a instrumental version of it as well, because a lot of these a lot of these companies look for incidental what they call incident, incidental music which is music that they use in transitional uh, scenes, you know, and they could use your, you know, you could, they could use your, your music if, if there's no vocals on it, they could use it for a scene like that. Usually those, those don't pay as much, but listen, you can make two or $300 on that, you know, why not? Uh, it, it's all a matter, right now it's all a matter of numbers. It's not about getting the big, the big placement or the big hit anymore. I think those days for, for the most part are gone. I think it's more about adding up, like adding up different placements and adding up little hits here and there and having that be your, your source, you know, try not to think of music anymore as, you know, well, I got to write my next, you know, huge hit, uh, my next Despacito, because those, it's, it's, those are very far, far to come by now uh, because Again, the industry is a whole different industry. Not that it can't happen and it will happen, you know, where one song will just take off globally. But you have a better chance at creating a, a library of music, especially if you want to get into the sync world, to do that, you know, do that. I know a couple of friends. I'm not, I'm not involved with Taxi, but I know another, a, a, a couple of my friends who have had a lot of success with the uh, company Taxi, which they, they're, they're a company that places... They, they charge a fee. I don't know what the fee is yearly. Uh, it's not cheap, but it's not crazy expensive either. Well, they are, they have, you know, they have a whole um, listing of, of music that's being sought out after. And they tell you how much it pays. They tell you what they're looking for. And then you submit music to that. And, you know, those are, that's, that's one, one way of doing it. I think that's very, some very, very good advice. And now let's talk about, the business of the royalty side or the synchronization. I know you've worked with, you know, major publishers and you've also worked as an independent artist. Mm -hmm. How do you create the, those type of relationships to where like the music supervisors or you know, the music curators, the people who are in charge of, you know, music in, in, in film, in media, what, is your approach or what would be your advice to you know approach to create these types of relationships i would say first of all have be prepared before you approach anybody make sure you have your your uh whatever material you have make sure you have it well recorded make sure that it sounds uh professional that's so important because what happens is when you when you do get an opportunity, you, you usually only get that one or one or two opportunities in your career, and if you're not prepared and you show somebody something that's not quality, that's gonna that's gonna kind of close the door on you for a bit. You know, you don't want to you don't want to you want to put your good foot forward first. You know, and that's that's my first advice. And if you're not sure if something sounds professional, if you're not sure if something is quality, you know. Pass it around to people that you trust, you know, people that, you know, that have good quality sense of music, you know, 
even if you have to go to like say like a music store and, and re reach out to one of the, the mostly all everybody that works in music stores are musicians so they'll have, usually have a good ear um reach out to people that are, you know if you go to a show i mean now there's no shows but uh, even, you know, online, reach out to musicians and say, listen, I have the song. I want you to tell me what you think, the quality of the song. So get that part prepared. Then in terms of reaching out, um, I would say it definitely it's all about connections in this industry. I would be I would be nowhere where I am now if I didn't create these relationships with people that I met along the way. And the way I create these relationships is by by meeting these people and keeping a honest relationship with them, you know, being polite, being, being professional, um, not being starstruck. You know, it's very easy to be starstruck if you meet one of your idols and like, oh my God. I mean, yeah, it's great, but they also want to see that you're professional, you know, and, and for you to be taken seriously, that's important for them too. You know what I mean? Uh, so create those kind of relationships uh, if you're at a concert and you see somebody you admire, you know, wait, wait for the right moment to come up to them. Have a business card ready with your number, an easy way of getting for them to get in touch with you. Another great source of, of like music supervisors and in general producers and stuff are the PROs. The PROs are BMI, ASCAP, CSAC, CSAC. and I recommend any, any young songwriter to sign up to any of those because those are great sources of, of uh, connections. Um, once you sign to ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC, and you, you can sign up for free, those are not, they don't, they don't cost you anything. Uh, then once you get in, try reaching out, go into their website, see who, who are the people that work there, send out emails, try to, if they have events, whenever events start again, try to go out to those events, try to, you have to network a lot, you have to meet a lot of people. You know, it, one person leads to another. It's this the way that, it's the way life works in general, but especially in this industry. So I would say join one of those, you know, BMI, ASCAP, you know, uh, CSAC, and and be, become proactive about who you want to meet in those places. You know, and um, a, a big part of me opening up my career was when I left New York. I had a very good connection. I was with ASCAP when I was in New York. My friend Ivora, I, Ivan Alvarez was the head of the Latin department at ASCAP. Uh, and we knew each other. And it was just one of those things that I knew him because somebody had introduced me to him. And he liked me. He didn't really know my music that much. But before I moved down to Miami, I, I got in touch with him. And he said, when you go down to Miami, get in touch with this guy. The guy that he got me in touch with was Rodolfo Castillo, the guy who wound up signing me to the first label that I was signed to. And the rest is history. So you never take for granted the person you meet along the way because that person can lead you to another person or that same person can lead you to the door that you want to get to, you know? All right. And I know you're 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 a board member of the of the foundation of the of NARAS. So how what resources that what resources does NARAS have that can offer uh artists, musicians who are looking for, for people to connect with or, you know, just regular resources, business resources, what resources does NARAS have that can offer uh, the community? Thank you for bringing that up. That's an excellent question because NARAS is, NARAS is uh, an excellent source to network, to connect. And you don't, you don't have to be a professional professional to be a member of, of the Grammys. To be a voting member, you do. But you could be an associate member if if you're already putting out music out there. You could be an associate member, uh, and even if you're not putting music out yet, but you're part of the industry. If you even if you're a manager, if you're an agent, if you're a songwriter, if you're a producer, you could become a, mem a member of the of the Grammys without being a voting member. Being a voting member takes a little bit more work, and there's a lot of restrictions and requirements. And once you're in, once you're in the Grammy uh, family, you can you can start networking. You can start, you know, you go on their website. They have a great website, you know, with a listing of events that are happening uh, happening around the town you live in or near you where you live. And usually those those events are attended by people like me, 
you know, I, I'll go to, to some of those events. And I'm very, as you know, I'm very approachable. You can come up to me and, and you can ask me a question. I'll be more than happy to get your, your you know, if you have uh, your card and you want to send me some music, I'm good at listening to music, giving you my opinion. If I think you're really good, I'll, you know, I'll try to connect you with people that I know. I'll, you know, if I think you're really good, I'll, I might be interested in working with you. Um, but yeah, definitely Naris is a great source. I would tell anybody, any young artist, Naris also has, they have for students, you could still, you could also join as a student, um, uh, Naris as, as a student uh, member. And uh, again, going back to, like I said, about PROs, BMI and ASCAPs of the world, Naris is another great source of networking. It's all about network, networking and connections and being prepared and, and knowing that what you have is a good representation of what you want to present, you know? Well, I, I think that's, a, that's an amazing resource, you know? A, a lot of the, the people that, you know, I, I met and how I got to you a couple of years ago was through uh, NARS and, and, and the Grammy Foundation. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's a beautiful, uh, organization and I think you know everybody should, should should look into it so just to wrap up this uh this interview I want to ask you how important is location is location uh as big as an as an issue as it was before you know if you're living in somebody somewhere that doesn't have uh music resources can you still uh, make noise and, and, you know, make a pathway. From years of experience and I, and I grew up, I, I was born in Cuba, but I, I got to New York when I was a year old. I lived in the biggest city in the world, arguably, you know, and I was a musician in New York and I, you know, and I knocked on a lot of doors and I played all over town and I never got the opportunities until I moved down to Miami, which is a smaller, it's a small, Miami's not a small city. But compared to New York, it's a, small, it's a smaller city. So especially now with, again, again, going back to social media, going back to the internet, you can be anywhere in the world and do music. You could, you know, be, be the big fish in a small pond. Don't be a small fish in a big pond. So my advice would be create, create your story from wherever you live. You know, if you're a, a musician, if you're a singer songwriter who likes to perform live, again, right now, not too many things are happening live, but music, live music will come back eventually next year, hopefully at some time. If you wanna play live, look for local, local places to, to perform, you know, even if at first you have to do it for free, which I don't advise, but if, you know, even if, if it's for tips, whatever, do it. If that's, if that's the route you wanna get, get through. You know, and if, it, if it's, you know, if, if you want to be more to the business end, then every city, every city is going to have some sort of music business, uh, some music industry hub, whether it's small, whether it's big, connect to it, you know, but be, be the big fish in that small pond. Don't, you don't need to go to New York City. You don't need to go to LA. You don't need to go to Nashville. I mean, if you want to, just because your, your own quality of life you want to, you love those cities and you want to live there, then that's a whole different story. But I wouldn't say move to those cities because you're going to make it. I don't right. know. That's not, that's not, that's not the, that's not a reality. I don't think anymore. Not that it ever it was either, but yeah, back then it was a lot more affordable. I mean, New York is a super expensive city. LA is super expensive. Nashville has gotten expensive. So you got to take all those things into consideration. If you're in a, if you're in a city that's a lot smaller and you're making a living, you're doing your music, then take advantage of it. You know, let everybody in that town that works in the music industry know who you are, you know? And once you get that following in that small city, then maybe you could expand and go out a little bit further. But create your story first where you live, in the town you live, and then, you know, explore other places once you, once you do that. Right. Well, I, I think that's, that's incredible advice. Uh, would you say that would be the same for, let's say, people who might live in a smaller market outside 
the the United States or like the United Kingdom is the, the big music markets. Let's say uh, Nicaragua, for example, or or Panama. You know, uh, I've had experience to where I've had artists or people I've worked with or or know that they are they're struggling because they the there might not be too much of too much of an infrastructure in those places. So we're not just talking about uh, like big music markets, but also we're talking about the, the smaller music markets. Would, right. would you, is your advice, would your advice be the same for people in those markets? Yeah, absolutely. You know what, if there's not, if there's not a, if there's not a format, if there's not a structure uh, there, then create it, create it, create your own one, you know? I mean, when I, when I first got to Miami, Miami wasn't known as a music town. It was like Latin music, but not, it wasn't really that organized, you know, but I was one of the pioneer, pioneers that, you know, I was a songwriter. I wanted to see songwriters come together. I was part of creating songwriters nights where songwriters could have a platform to come out and perform. So create it, you know, create, create it. If you, if you're really hungry and you really want to do it, then be, be your own, be your own creator of your, of your story, you know, do it. Don't, don't let other people uh, do the work for you, you know? And if you see somebody who's doing it, but maybe needs help, then to approach them and say, hey, do you need help? Do you need somebody to partner up with you? I want, I want to see a music industry happen here, even if it's small, you know? I mean, I, you know, I, when I travel, I, you know, I've been to places like Costa Rica where I have a lot of great friends there who I remember them complaining to me about the same thing. Yeah, but this is Costa Rica. You know, everybody's pura vida. Everybody wants to go surf and have a good time. You know, there's great musicians here, but nobody wants to do the work. Oh, well, then you guys create it, you know? And I've, you know, I've taught songwriting seminars there. And I like, you know, create create your story, create your scene. Cause that, you know, nobody else is gonna come in and do it. And if they do, they're, they're gonna take, they're gonna take full credit for it. And they're gonna take all the, uh, all the advantage of it, so. Why, why wait for that to happen? You know, be your own, be your own thing, you know, create your own story. Right. So just to end this, what is your number one advice to all the aspiring up and coming musicians, uh, business people? What is your one advice you would tell them? I would say prepare, 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 prepare yourself for whatever, whatever, whatever facet of the industry you want to get into, make sure you're prepared. You know, I'm not saying you have to be the most talented singer songwriter. You don't have to be the most talented instrumentalist. You don't have to be the most talented manager, but be confident that when you're ready to go out there, you know, your shit, like, you know, what you're going to say, you know, what you're going to, you know, how you're going to act. Don't go, don't go into a room thinking you're the, the biggest talent in the room because it's going to fire back on you you know make sure that you're humble make sure that you appreciate what 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 you're going into and be professional be professional at every moment in your life and treat people the way you want to be treated well thank you elson and stay tuned for the next episode this is the music biz club thank you brother take care of yourself <laughs>